Hey everyone, welcome to this event, Build Your Cloud Center of Excellence. I'm your host, Lisa Martin, and I have two guests here with me today to talk about the hybrid cloud, the multi-cloud trends, and specifically the complexity. While we know these trends provide agility and flexibility for customers, they also bring in complexity, and this session is going to focus on exploring that with RBI and Hitachi Vantara. Please welcome my guests, Aditya Sastri, the SVP of Digital Solutions at Hitachi Vantara, and Werner Mayer, Head of Group Core IT and Head of Group Data at RBI International. Guys, welcome to the program. Thank you, Lisa. Werner, nice to see you again. And Werner, we're going to start with you. Talk about RBI, tell the audience a little bit about what the business is, and then we're going to get into your cloud transformation journey over the last couple of years. Yes. Thank you. So Raiffeisen Bank International is an international working banking group. So our core markets are Central Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe and Austria. And we're serving around 50 million clients in this market. So we're active in 13 markets. Got it. Talk to me, Werner, about the cloud transformation journey that RBI has been on over the last couple of years and some of the complexities that you've experienced as you've launched it. Sure, thank you for the question. So in 2020, we decided uh, that we have to renew our IT strategy. And the aim of the strategy was uh, to change the organization in a, in a way uh, that it can react and adapt fast to the future challenges. So one of the important pillars for us was uh, that we adapt in fast also for new technologies. And this was core pillar in our strategy. So we are, we're, we're searching for technologies which are fitting to our HR transformation and we found that the cloud and the public cloud environment fits to this uh, venture. So we tested that, and we're building up also the competence centers for that and also established the group platform for that because our aim was to onboard our international group with the 13 units to this group uh, cloud platform. So that means we have a lot to do to hardening the platforms in terms of security, to put in the high standards for that we have to introduce large scale programs uh, to train hundreds of engineers. We tested the approach, we convinced the top management and we impl implemented this, this program. So one of the highlights was of course also the, the safeguarding of the Ukraine, uh, let's say a banking environment. So we had to lift and shift the complete bank in three months. And it shows that let's say our platforms works and let's say the approach is proven that we can scale it over the group. That's a big challenge, a lot of complexity, especially with some of the global things going on. And if you had, these challenges are, are not unique to RBI, a lot of your customers are facing challenges with complexity around cloud management, cloud ops. What, can you unpack what the real issue is here? Yeah, Lisa, absolutely. And you know, before I answer your question, I do want to, you know, just say a couple of things about Raiffeisen Bank. And, uh, you know, we've had the pleasure of working with them for about a year a little bit more than a year now. And, and the way they approach the cloud transformation journey um, is, is, should be a template for a lot of the organizations in terms of the preparation, in terms of understanding, you know, how other companies have done it and what are the pitfalls, what's worked, and really what's the recipe for their, you know, journey, right? Which is very unique because, you know, you look at, you know, being present across 30 different countries within Central and Eastern Europe, as Werner said, and the complexities of dealing with local regulations, GDPR, and all these other issues that come with it, right? And not to mention the language uh, variation from country to country. So, uh, you know, phenomenal uh, story there, the journey, and the journey still goes, right, Werner? It's, it's not complete yet. But uh, Lisa, Lisa to, to your question, uh, you know, when, when we look at kind of the, the complexities of this transformation that most a lot of enterprises are going through, it's not very unique, right? Um, what is unique for a Pfizer bank is, has been the preparation. But as you get into this journey of moving workloads to the cloud, be it refactoring, modernizing, migrating, et cetera, one of the things that really uh, is often overlooked is are my applications applications and data workloads resilient uh, on, on, the, uh, on the cloud? Meaning are they how is the performance? Are they just running or are they performing with high availability to meet your customer's goals? Is it scalable? And are my costs in line with what I projected when I moved to the ground, right? Because that's one of the areas we're seeing where, um, you know, what enterprises projected from a cost savings 
to what they're realizing a year and a half into the journey is a pretty big delta, right? And and, and a lot of it is dependent on uh, are the cloud are the applications and the workloads cloud designed for the cloud or are they designed for on-prem, which you just move into the cloud. So Werner, it sounds like what Aditya said uh, is a compliment to, to you guys and the team at RBI in terms of this being a template for managing complexity. Give us, Werner, your perspective in terms of modern cloud ops. What's in, what's out, what is it that customers really need to be focusing on to be successful? Thanks for the compliment that it, and I think it is a great uh, relationship also in the journey. I mean, the overall uh, topic is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a complex uh, program where a lot of things have to fit together. But it was mentioning the resilience, uh, the costs, we call it FinOps, uh, security operations and so on have to come together and have to work on spot. Uh, at the end, uh, it's also, let's say, how we are able, enabling our teams and how we are uh, ramping out the skills of our teams to deal with these multidimensional, let's say, environments. And this is something what we spend a lot of time in order to prepare it, but also to uh, bring up the people on a certain level that they can operate it. Because cloud, cloud handling is uh, is different than before. Because beforehand you have central operations team, they do everything for you. But in this world, let's say we're also uh, putting the responsibility of the run component of the apps into the, in the tribes and the application teams. And they have to do much more than before. On the other hand, we have uh, central rules, we have monitoring functions, we have uh, support functions on that in order to best support them in their journey. So this is a hybrid between, let's say what the teams have to do with the responsibility in the teams, but also with the central functions which are supporting them. And everything has to work together and goes hand in, right, to go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if, if I could just add Lisa really quick, and, and Werner hit the nail on the head, right? Because you cannot look at cloud operation the way we have traditionally looked at managed services. That's the key thing, right? You cannot, you know, traditional managed services, you had L1, L2, L3, and then it goes into some sort of a vacuum, and then all of a sudden somebody calls you at some point, right? And exactly. that really has flipped, right? To, to Werner's point, and Werner hit that nail on the head, because you really have to understand, bring an engineering-led approach to make sure that the problems, you know, when you see an issue, that you have some level of automation in terms of problem isolation, and then the problem is routed the right individual, i.e. the application engineering team or the data engineering team for resolution in a rapid manner. Right, I think a very, the key thing. Yes. a very important point for that is said, yeah. So you cannot traditional transport, let's say the operation model, what you have now into the cloud, because this will not work. Yeah? And finally, at the end, you will not benefit on the technology possibilities there. So super important point. My vision in the cloud, and this is also something what we're working on is a sort of zero ops environment, yeah? Because with auto heat dealing with the automatization technologies and so on, you can that much, do much more uh, compared to the traditional environment. And the benefit of the cloud is you can test it, you can give it feedback when it is not working. Yeah? So it's a completely different operating model what we try to establish in the cloud environment. So really what this seems like guys is, is quite a delicate balance that you're solving for, not the only delicate balance, but Werner, sticking with you, talk to us about some of the challenges that you've had around cloud cost management in particular. Help us understand that. Thanks for the question. So in principle, we're doing very well on the cost side, surprisingly. Uh, and we also started the cloud journey that we said, this is not the cost case. Because as I said before, uh, let's say one of the pillars in the strategy, strategy was the enablement of technology to the benefit of customer solutions to be adaptive, to be faster. But at the end, it turned out that let's say with giving the responsibility of the operation to the dedicated team, they, they, they were working much closer to the costs and let's say monitoring the costs than we had it in the traditional environments. Yeah, I also saw some examples in the group where sort of uh, gamification of the costs were going on to say who can save more and, and make more, much more out of that what you have in the cloud. And at the end we see that in minimum the costs are balanced to the uh, traditional environments in the data centers but we also saw that, let's say, the costs were brought down much more uh, than before. 
So at the beginning, we were relative conservative with the assumptions. Yeah? But it turns out that we are really getting the benefit. The things are getting faster and also the costs are going down. And we see this in real cases. Yeah, and, and, and Lisa, if I could add something really quick, right? Because, you know, <clears throat> there's been a mad rush to the cloud, right? Everybody kind of, it was, you know, the buzz, the buzz was, let's get to the cloud. We'll start to realize all these savings and all of a sudden everything kind of magically gets better. Right, and um, what we have seen is also, you know, companies, or customers, or enterprises that have started this journey about five, six years ago, and are about, you know, a few years into it. What we are realizing is the cloud costs have increased significantly to what their projections were early on, and the way they're trying to address the cloud costs is by creating a FinOps organization that's looking at, you know, the cost of cloud from a structure standpoint and forth as a reactive measure saying, hey, if we move from Azure or one provider to another, is there any benefit? If we move certain applications from the cloud back to on-prem, is there any benefit? When in fact, one of the things that we have noticed really is the problem needs to shift left to the engineering teams. Because if you're designing the applications and the uh, systems the right way to begin with, then you can manage the, uh, the, the cost issues or the cost overruns, right? So you design for the cloud as opposed to designing and then looking at how to be optimized cloud. So Dithya, so you talked about the RBI use case as really kind of a template, but also yeah. some of the challenges with respect to hybrid and multi-cloud are kind of like a chicken and egg scenario. Talk to it, us kind of like overall about how Hitachi is really helping customers address these challenges and maximize the benefits to get the flexibility, to get the agility so that they can deliver what their end user customers are expecting. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things we are doing, Lisa, when we work with customers is really trying to understand, you know, look at their entire portfolio of applications, right? And, and look at what the intent of the applications is between customer facing, external customer, internal customer, high availability, production, et cetera, right? And then we go through a methodology called E3, which is envision, enable, and execute, which is really envision what the end state should be, regardless of what the environment is, right? And then we enable, which is really kind of go through a proof of value to move a few workloads to modernize, re-architect, re-platform, et cetera, and look at the benefit of that application on its destination, if it's a cloud, if it's a, a cloud service provider, or if it's another data center, whatever it may be, right? And finally, you know, once we've proven the value and the benefit, and and say and, and kind of monetize the, you know, realize the value of it uh, from an agility, from a cost, from security and resilience, etc., then we go through the execution, which was look, we look at the entire portfolio, the entire landscape, and we go through a very disciplined manner, working with our customers to roadmap it and then we execute in a very deliberate manner where you can see value every two to three months. Because gone are the days when you can do things as a science project that took two to three years, right? We, we, everyone wants to see value, want to see, wants to see progress. And most importantly, we want to see cost benefit and agility sooner than later. Those are incredibly important outcomes. Uh, you guys have done a great job explaining what you're doing together. This sounds like a great relationship. All right, so my last question to both of you is, if I'm a customer and I'm planning a cloud transformation for my company, what are the two things you want me to remember and consider as I plan this? Werner, we'll start with you. I would pick up two things, yeah. Uh, the first one is, uh, when you are organizing your, your company in an HR way, then cloud is the HR technology for the HR transformation uh, because HR teams need HR technology. And the second important thing, what I would see is uh, cloud is a, is a large scale and fast moving technology enabler to the company. So if your company is going forward to say, technology is the enabler to form a future business, then cloud can support this journey. Excellent, I'm going to walk away with those. And Aditya, yeah, same question to you. I'm a, I'm a customer, I'm at an organization, I'm planning a cloud transformation. Top two things you want me to walk away with. Yeah, and I think Werner can actually touch on that in the second one, which is it's not a tech, just an IT or a technology initiative. It is a business initiative, right? Because ultimately what you do from this cloud journey 
should drive, you know, should lead into business transformation or help your business grow top line or drive margin expansion, et cetera. So a couple of things I would say, right? One is, you know, get buying and prioritize work with your business owners with, uh, you know, with the cross-functional team, not just the technology team. That's one. The second thing is as the technology team or the IT team shepherds this journey, you know, keep everyone informed and engaged as you go through this journey, because as you go through moving workloads, modernizing workload, there is an impact to, you know, receivables through omni-channel experiences, the way customers interact and transact with you, right? And that comes with make, making sure your businesses are aware, your business stakeholders are aware, so in turn, the end customers are aware. So, you know, it's not a one and done from an engagement, it's a journey and bring in the right experts, talk to people who have done it, done this before, who have kind of stepped in all the pitfalls, so you don't have to, right? That's the key. That's great advice. That's great advice for anything in life, I think. You yeah. talk about the collaboration, the importance of the business and the technology folks coming together. It really has to be, it's a delicate balance, as we said before, but it really has to be a holistic, collaborative approach. Guys, thank you so much for joining me, talking through what Hitachi Vantara and RBI are doing together. It sounds like you're well into this journey and it sounds like it's going quite well. We thank you so much for your insights and your perspectives. Thank you, Lisa. Werner, thank, thank you, Lisa. Lisa. Good stuff, guys. For my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. Thank you so much for watching our event, Build Your Cloud Center of Excellence. Our founder, Namahe Odaira, has a vision of converting Japan from coal-fired steam power to hydroelectric power. Hitachi designed and built the first hydroelectric generator in Japan. Sustainability is in the DNA of our family of companies. We're in this for everyone. At Hitachi Vantara, we're making data centers, not only eco-friendly, but eco-first and foremost, reducing carbon emissions and consuming 65% less energy. Hitachi Vantara, for the planet, for the data-driven. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to this event, Building Your Cloud Center of Excellence with Hitachi Vantara. I'm your host, Lisa Martin. I've got a couple of guests here with me next to talk about redefining cloud operations and application modernization for customers. Please welcome Pram Balasubramanian, the SVP and CTO at Hitachi Vantara. And Manoj Narayanan is here as well, the Managing Director of Technology at GTCR. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Excited to have this conversation about redefining cloud ops with you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Pram, let's go ahead and start with you. You have done well over a thousand cloud engagements in your career. I'd love to get your point of view on how the complexity around cloud operations and management has evolved in the last, say, three to four years. It's a great question, Lisa. Uh, before we understand the complexity around the management itself, the cloud has evolved over the last decade significantly from being a backend infrastructure or infrastructure as a service for many companies to become the business for many companies. If you think about a lot of these cloud bond companies, cloud is where their entire workload and their business runs. With that as a background for this conversation, uh, if you think about the cloud operations, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of lift and shift happening in the market, where people lifted their workloads or applications and moved them onto the cloud, where they treated cloud significantly as an infrastructure. And the way they started to manage it was, again, the same form as they were managing their on-prem infrastructure. And they call it INO, infrastructure and operations. That's kind of the way traditionally cloud was managed. In the last few years, we have seen a significant shift around thinking of cloud more as a workload rather than as just an infrastructure. And what I mean by workload is in the cloud, everything is now code. So you're codifying your infrastructure. That application is already code and your data is also codified as data services. With now that context applying, the way you think about managing the cloud has to significantly change. And many companies are moving towards trying to change their models to look at this complex environment as opposed to treating it like a simple infrastructure that is sitting somewhere else. So that's one of the 
uh, biggest changes and shifts uh, that are causing a lot of complexity and headache for actually a lot of customers for managing environments. The second critical aspect is even uh, that even exacerbates the situation is multi-cloud environments. Now there are companies that have got it right with things about right cloud for the right workload. So there are companies that I reach out and I talk with, they've got their office applications and emails and stuff running on Microsoft 365, which can be on the Azure cloud. Whereas they're running their engineering applications, the ones that they build and leverage for their end customers on Amazon. And to some extent they've got it right, but still they have a multiple cloud that they have to go after and maintain. This becomes complex when you have two clouds for the same type of workload. When I have to host applications for my end customers on Amazon, as well as Azure, as well as Google, then I get into security issues that I have to be consistent across all three. I get into talent because I need to have people that focus on Amazon as well as Azure, as well as Google, which means I need so much more workforce. I need so many, so much more uh, skills that I need to build, right? That's becoming the second issue. And the third one is around data costs. Can I make these clouds talk to each other? Then you get into the ingress, egress costs and that creates some complexity. So bringing all of this together and managing is really become, becoming more complex for our customers. And obviously as a part of this, we will talk about some of the uh, some of the ideas that we can bring forth in managing such complex environments, but this is what we are seeing in terms of why the complexity has become a lot more in the last few years. Right, a lot of complexity in the last few years. Manoj, let's bring you into the conversation now. Before we dig into your cloud environment, give the audience a little bit of an overview of GTCR. What kind of company are you? What do you guys do? Definitely, Lisa. Uh, GTCR is a Chicago-based private equity firm. We've been in the market for more than 40 years. And what we do is we invest in companies across different sectors. Uh, and then we manage the company, drive it to increase the value, and then over a period of time, uh, sell it to future buyers. So in a nutshell, we got a large portfolio of companies that we need to manage and make sure that they perform to expectations. Uh, and yeah. my role within GTCR, uh, is from a technology viewpoint, so where I work with uh, all the companies, their technology leadership to make sure that we are getting the best out of technology and technology today drives everything. So how can technology be a good complement to the business itself? So, so my role is to play that intermediary role to make sure that there is synergy between the investment thesis and the technology levers that we can pull and also work with partners like Hitachi to make sure that it is done in an optimal manner. I like that you said you know, technology needs to really complement the business and vice versa. So Manoj, let's get into the cloud operations environment at GTCR. Talk to me about what the experience has been the last couple of years. Give us an idea of some of the challenges that you were facing with existing cloud ops and, and the solution that you're using from Hitachi Ventara. Uh, absolutely. In fact, in fact Prem uh, phrased it really well. Uh, one of the key things that we're facing is the workload management. So there's so many choices there, so much complexities. We have these companies buying more companies. There is organic growth that is happening. So the variables that we have to deal with are very high in such a scenario to make sure that the workload management of each of the companies are done in an optimal manner is becoming an increasing concern. So, so that's one area uh, where uh, any help we can get, anything we can try to make sure it is done better becomes a huge value added. Uh, a second aspect is a financial transparency. Uh, we need to know where the money is going, where the money is coming in from, what is the scale, especially in a cloud environment, we are talking about an auto scale ecosystem, having that financial transparency and the metrics associated with that, it, these, these become very, very critical to ensure that we have a successful presence in the multi-cloud environment. Talk a little bit about the solution that you're using with Hitachi and, and the challenges that it is eradicated. Yeah, so it, it, end of the day, right, we, we need to focus on our core competence. So, so we have got a very strong technology leadership team. We've got a very strong presence in the respective domains of each of the portfolio companies. But where Hitachi comes in and HAR comes in as a solution is that they allow us to excel in focusing on our core business and then make sure that we are able to take care of workload management or financial transparency, 
all of that is taken off the table from us and and hitachi manages it for us right so it's it's a perfectly complementary relationship where they act as two partners and hark as a solution is extremely useful in driving that uh, and 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 i'm anticipating that it will become more important with time as the complexity of cloud and cloud associated workloads are only becoming more challenging to manage and not less Right. That's the thing that complexity is there and it's also increasing. Prem, you talked about the complexities that are existent today with respect to cloud operations, the things that have happened over the last couple of years. What are some of your tips, Prem, for the audience, like the, the top two or three things that you would say on cloud operations that, that people need to understand so that they can manage that complexity and allow their business to be driven and complemented by technology? Yeah, a big great question again, Lisa, right? And, and I think Manoj alluded to a few of these things as well. The first one is in the new world of the cloud, I think think of migration, modernization, and management as a single continuum to the cloud. Now, there is no lift and shift, and there is no, hey, somebody else separately manages it, right? If you do not lift and shift the right applications the right way onto the cloud, you are going to deal with the complexity of managing it, and you'll end up spending more money time and effort in managing it. So that's number one. Migration, modernization, management of cloud workloads is a single continuum and it's not three separate activities, right? That's number one. In the, the second is cost. Cost traditionally has been an afterthought, right? People move the workload to the cloud. And I think, again, like I said, I'll refer back to what Manoj said. Once we move it to the cloud and then we put all these fancy engineering capability around self-provisioning. Every developer can go and ask for what he or she wants and they get an environment immediately spun up, so on and so forth. Suddenly the CIO wakes up to a bill that is significantly larger than what he or she expected. Right, and, and this is this has become a bit common nowadays, right? The, the challenge is because we think cost in the cloud as an afterthought. Now consider this example. In, in previous world, you buy hardware, you put it in your data center, you have already amortized the cost as a CapEx. So you can write an application, throw it onto the infrastructure, and the application continues to use the infrastructure until you hit a ceiling, you don't care about the money you spent. But if I write a line of code that is inefficient today, and I deploy it on the cloud, from minute one, I am paying for the inefficiency. So if I realize it after six months, I've already spent the money. So financial discipline, especially when managing the cloud, is no, is no more an afterthought. It is as much something that you have to include in your engineering practice as much as any other DevOps practices, right? Those are my top two tips, Lisa, from my standpoint. Think about cloud, think about cloud, work, cloud workloads. And the last one, again, and you will see, you will hear me saying this again and again. Get into the mindset of everything is code. You don't have a touch and feel infrastructure anymore. So you don't really need to have foot on the ground to go manage that infrastructure. It's codified. So your code should be managing it. Now think of how it happens, right? That's where we, we're going uh, as an evolution for this. Everything is code. That's great advice, great tips for the audience there. Manoj, let's bring you back into the conversation. You know, we can talk about skills gaps on, on in many different facets of technology. The SRE role, relatively new skill set. Uh, we're hearing, hearing a lot about it. SRE-led DevSecOps is probably even more so of a new skill set. If I'm an IT leader or an application leader, how do I ensure that I have the right skill set within my organization to be able to manage my cloud operations, to, to dial down that complexity so that I can really operate successfully as a business? Yeah, so unfortunately, there is no perfect answer, right? It's such a such a scarce skill set that any day, any of the portfolio company CTOs, if I go and talk and say, hey, here is a great SRE team member, they will be more than willing to fight with each other to get the person in, right? It's, it's that scarce a skill set. So, so a few things we need to look at it. One is, how can I build it within, right? So nobody gets born as an SRE. Uh, you, you make a person an SRE. So how do you inculcate that culture? So like Prem said earlier, right? Everything is software. So how do we make sure that everybody inculcates that as part of their operating philosophy, be they part of the operations team or the development team or the testing team? They need to understand that 
That is the common guideline and common objective that we are driving towards. So, so that skill set and that associated training needs to be driven from within the organization. And that, in my mind, is the fastest way to make sure that that role gets propagated across the organization. That is one. Uh, the second thing is uh, rely on the right partners. So it's not going to be possible for us to get all of these roles built in house. So instead, prioritize what roles need to be done from within the organization and what roles can we rely on our partners to drive it for us. So that becomes a, an important consideration for us to look at as well. Absolutely. That partnership angle is incredibly important to, from, from the, the beginning, really kind of weaving these companies together on this journey to, to redefine cloud operations and build that, as we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, really building a cloud center of excellence that allows the organization to be competitive, successful, and, and really deliver what the end user is, is expecting. And from may I want to ask, sorry, Lisa, may I add something to it? I think. Sure. Yeah, one of the one of the common things that I tell customers when we talk about SRE, and to Manoj's point is, don't think of SRE as a skill set, which is the common way today the industry tries to solve the problem. SRE is a mindset, right? Everybody well, in a well company, said, well said, yeah. Thanks, Manoj. So everybody in a company should think of him or her as a site reliability engineer. Uh, and everybody has a role in it, right? Even if you take the new process layout from SRE, there are individuals that are responsible to whom we can go to when there is a problem directly, as opposed to going through the traditional ways of, hey, I talk to L1 and L1 can't resolve, they go to L2 and then go to L3. So we, we're, we're trying to move away from an issue escalation model to what we call as the uh, uh, issue routing or an uh, incident routing model, right? Move away from incident escalation to an incident routing model so you get to route to the right folks. So again, to sum it up, SRE should not be solved as a skill set because there is not enough people in the market to solve it that way. If you start solving it as a mindset, I think companies can get a handle of it. I love that. I've actually never heard that before, but it, it makes perfect sense to think about the SRE as a mindset rather than a skill set that will allow organizations to be much more successful. Prem, I wanted to get your thoughts as enterprises are, are innovating, they're moving more products and services to the as a service model. Talk about how the dev teams, the ops teams are working together to build and run reliable cost efficient services. Are they working better together? Um, again, a, a very polarizing question because some customers are getting it right, many customers aren't. There is still a big wall between development and operations, right? Even when you think about DevOps as a terminology, the fundamental principle was to make sure Dev and Ops works together. But what many companies have achieved today, honestly, is automating the operations for development. For example, as a developer, I can check in code and my code will appear in production without any friction, right? There is automated testing, automated provisioning, and it gets promoted to production. But after production, it goes back into the 20 year old model of operating the code, right? So there is more work that needs to be done for dev and ops to come closer and work together. And one of the ways that we think this is achievable is not by doing radical org changes, but more by focusing on a product-oriented single backlog approach across development and operations, which is, again, there is change management involved, but I think that's a way to start embracing uh, the culture of dev and ops coming together much better. Now, again, SRE principles, as we double click and understand it more, and Google has done a very good job laying it out for the world, as you think about SRE principle, there are ways and means in that process of how to think about a single backlog. And in HARC, Hitachi Application Reliability Centers, we've really got a way to look at prioritizing the backlog. And what I mean by that is dev teams try to work on backlog that come from product managers on features. The SRE and the operations team try to put backlog into the same, sorry, try to put features into the same backlog for improving stability, availability, and financials or financial optimization of your code. And there are ways when you look at your SLOs and error budgets 
to really coach the product teams to prioritize your backlog based on what's important for you. So if you understand you're spending more money, then you reduce your product features going in and implement the financial optimization that came from your operations team, right? So you now have the ability to throttle these parameters. And that's where SRE becomes a mindset and a principle as opposed to a skill set, because this is not an individual telling you to do. This is the company that is embarking on how to prioritize my backlog beyond just user features. Right. Great point. Last question for both of you is the same. Top kind of takeaway things that you want me to remember if I'm an IT leader at, at an organization and I am planning on redefining cloud ops for my company. Manoj, we'll start with you and then Prem go to you. What are the top two things that you want me to walk away with understanding how to do that successfully? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to basics. So the two things I would say need to be taken care of is one is customer experience. So all the things that I do, end of the day, is it improving the customer experience or not? So that's the first metric. The second thing is anything that I do, is there an ROI by doing that incremental step or not? Otherwise, we might get lost in the technology, wizardry, the new tech, et cetera. But end of the day, if the customers are not happy, if there is no ROI, everything else uh, is just garnished on top of that. Now, it's all about the customer experience, right? That's so true. From what are your thoughts on the, the top things that I need to be taking away if I am a leader planning to redefine my cloud and my company? Absolutely. And I think from a, from a company standpoint, I think Manoj summarized it extremely well, right? There is this ROI and there is this customer experience. From my end, again, I'll, I'll suggest two, two more things as a takeaway, right? One, cloud cost is not an afterthought. It's essential for us to think about it upfront. Number two, do not delink migration, modernization, and operations. They are one stream. If you migrate a long, wrong workload onto the cloud, you're going to be stuck with it for a long time. And an example of a wrong workload, Lisa, for everybody that, that is listening to this is, if my cost per transaction profile doesn't change, and I am not improving my revenue per transaction for a piece of code that's going to run in production, it's better off running in a data center where my cost is capex and amortized and I have control over when I want to upgrade as opposed to putting it on a cloud and continuing to pay unless it gives me more dividends towards improvement. But that's a simple example of when we think about what should I migrate and how will it cost pain when I want to manage it in the longer run. But that's, that's something that I'll leave the audience and you with as a takeaway. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much for talking to me today about what Hitachi Ventura and GTC are doing together, how you've really dialed down those complexities, enabling the business and the technology folks to really live harmoniously. We appreciate your insights and your perspectives on building a cloud center of excellence. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. For my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching this event, Building Your Cloud Center of Excellence with Hitachi Vantara. Thanks for watching. Data centers account for about 4% of the total greenhouse gas emissions worldwide and it's about to rise. Hitachi Ventura is committed to changing that. We look at every aspect of our storage business. Hitachi has reduced the annual carbon footprint of VSP by up to 86% since 2014. We are in this for everyone. At Hitachi Vantara, we're making data centers not only eco-friendly, but eco-first and foremost, reducing carbon emissions and consuming 65% less energy. Hitachi Vantara, for the planet, for the data-driven. Hey everyone, welcome to this event, Build Your Cloud Center of Excellence. 
I'm your host, Lisa Martin. In the next 15 minutes or so, my guests and I are going to be talking about redefining cloud operations and application modernization for customers, and specifically how partners are helping to speed up that process. As you saw in our first two segments, we talked about problems enterprises are facing with cloud operations. We talked about redefining cloud operations as well to solve these problems. This segment is going to be focusing on how Hitachi Ventura's partners are really helping to speed up that process. We've got Johnson Controls here to talk about their partnership with Hitachi Ventura. Please welcome both of my guests. Pram Bala Subramanian is with us, SVP and CTO Digital Solutions at Hitachi Ventura. And Suresh Muthukuru, SVP Customer Success, Platform Engineering and Reliability Engineering from Johnson Controls. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Great to have you. Thank you, Lisa. First question is to both of you, and Suresh, we'll start with you. We want to understand, you know, the cloud operations landscape is increasingly complex. We've talked a lot about that in this program. Talk to us, Suresh, about some of the biggest challenges and pain points that you faced with respect to that. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, cloud has evolved a lot in the last 10 years. You know, when we were talking about a single cloud, whether it's Azure or AWS and GCP, and that was complex enough. Now we are talking about multi-cloud and hybrid. And if you look at Johnson Controls, we have Azure, we have AWS, we have GCP, we have Alibaba, and we also support on-prem. So the architecture has become very, very complex. And, and the complexity has grown so much that we are now thinking about whether we should be cloud native or cloud, or cloud agnostic. So I think, I think uh, it, it's, I mean, sometimes it's hard to even explain the complexity because people think, oh, when you go to cloud, everything is simplified. <laughs> cloud does give you a lot of simplicity, but it also really brings a lot more complexity along with it. So, uh, and then the next one is pretty important is, you know, generally when you look at cloud services, you have plenty of services that are offered within a cloud, 100, 150 services, 200 services. Even within those companies, you take AWS, they might not know, uh, an individual resource might not know about all the services. We see that's a big challenge for us as a customer to really understand each of the service that is provided in these uh, you know, clouds. Well, it doesn't matter which one that is. And the third one is pretty big, at least at the CTO, the CIO, and the senior leadership level, is cost. Cost is a major factor because cloud you know, uh, will eat you up if you cannot manage it, if you don't have a good cloud governance process, it, because every minute you're in it, it's burning cash. So I think if you ask me, these are the three major things that I am facing day to day, and that's where I use my partners, which I'll touch base uh, down the line. Perfect, we'll talk about that. So Prem, I imagine that these problems are not unique to Johnson Controls or JCI, as you may hear, it, hear us refer to it. Talk to me, Prem, about some of the other challenges that you're seeing within the customer landscape. So yeah, I, I agree. These are these are not very specific to JCA, but there are specific issues in JCA, right? So the way we think about these are, there is there is a common issue when people go to the cloud, and there are very specific and unique issues for businesses, right? So JCA, and we will talk about this in the episode as we move forward. I think Suresh and his team has done some phenomenal step step around how to manage this complexity, but there are customers who have a lesser complex cloud, which is they don't go to Alibaba, they don't have footprint in all three clouds. So their multi-cloud footprint could be a bit more manageable, but still struggle with a lot of the same problems around cost, around security, around talent. Talent is a big thing, right? And in Suresh's case, I think it's, it's slightly more exasperated because every cloud provider, be it AWS, GCP, or Azure, brings in hundreds of services, and there is nobody, including Many of us, right? We learn every day now, nowadays, right? It's not that there is one service integrator who knows all. Well, well, technically people can claim as a part of sales, but in reality, all of us are continuing to learn in this landscape. And if you take, if you put all of this equation together with multiple clouds, the complexity just starts to exponentially grow. And that's exactly what I think JCI is experiencing and Suresh's team has been experiencing and we've been working together. But the, but the common problems are around security, talent, and cost management of this. Right? Those, are, those are my three things. Uh, and one last thing that I would love to say before, before we move away from this question, 
is if you think about cloud operations as a concept that's even evolving over the last few years, uh, and I've touched upon this in the previous episode as well, Lisa, right? If you take architectures, we've gone into microservices, we've gone into all these uh, serverless architectures, all the fancy things that we want, that helps us go to market faster, be more competitive as a business. But that's not simplified stuff, right? That's complicated stuff. It's a lot more distributed. Second, again, we've advanced and created more modern infrastructure because all of what we are talking is platform as a service, services on the cloud that we are consuming, right? In the same case with development, we moved into a DevOps model. We, we kind of click a button, put some code in a repository. The code starts to run in production within a minute. Everything else is automated. But then when we get to operations, we're still stuck in a very old way of looking at cloud as an infrastructure, right? So you've got an infra team, you've got an app team, you've got an incident management team, you've got a soft lock, everything. But again, Suresh, Suresh can talk about this more because they are making significant strides in thinking about this as a single workload. And how do I apply engineering to go manage this? Because a lot of it is codified, right? So automation. Anyway, so that's kind of where the complexity is and how we are thinking, including JCI as a partner, thinking about taming that complexity as we move forward. Suresh, let's talk about that, taming the complexity. You guys have both done a great job of articulating the ostensible challenges that are there with cloud, especially multi-cloud environments that you're living in. But Suresh, talk about the partnership with Hitachi Ventura. How is it helping to dial down some of those inherent complexities? I mean, I, I, I always, uh, you know, I think I've said this to Prem multiple times. Uh, I treat my partners as my internal, you know, you know, employees. I look at Prem as my coworker or my peer, isn't it? So the reason for that is I want Prem to have the same vested interest as a partner uh, in my success or GCI success and vice versa, isn't it? I think that's how we operate and that's how we have been operating. And I, I think I would like to thank um, Prem and Hitachi Ventura for that. Really been an amazing partnership. And as he was saying, uh, we have taken a completely holistic approach to how we want to really be in the market and play in the market to our, to our customers. So if you look at my jacket, it talks about open blue platform. This is what JCI is building, isn't that we are building this open blue digital platform and, and within that, my team, along with Prems or Hitachi, we have built what we call as Polaris. It's a technical platform where our apps um, can run. And this platform is automated end to end. Um, from a platform engineering standpoint, we stood up a platform engineering organization, a reliability engineering organization, as well as a support organization. Where Hitachi played a role, as I said previously, you know, for me to scale, I'm not going to really have the talent and the knowledge uh, of every function that I'm looking at. And Hitachi, not only they brought the talent, but they also brought what he was talking about, Hark. You know, they have set up a lab and now we can leverage it. And uh, they also came up with some really interesting concepts. I went and met them in India. They came up with this call, a concept called IPL. Okay, what is that? They really challenged all their employees that's working for GCI to come up with innovative ideas to solve problems proactively, which is self-healing. You know, how you do that. So I think partners, you know, if they become really vested in your interests, they can do wonders for you. And I think in this case, Hitachi is really working very well for us in, in many aspects. And I'm leveraging them. You started with support. Now I'm leveraging them in the automation, the platform engineering as well as in the reliability engineering, and then in, even in the engineering spaces, and that like they are my end-to-end -end partner right now. So. so you're really taking that holistic approach that you talked about, and it sounds like it's a very collaborative, two-way street partnership. Prem, I want to go back to you. Um, Suresh mentioned Hark. Talk a little bit about what Hark is and then how partners fit into Hitachi's Hark strategy. Uh, great. So let, let me spend like a few seconds on what Hark is, Liz. Again, I know we've been using the term. Hark stands for Hitachi Application Reliability Centers. Now, the, the reason we, we thought about Hark was, like I said in the beginning of this segment, there is an evolution from an architecture standpoint to be more modern, microservices, serverless, reactive architecture, so on and so forth. There is an evolution in your development methodology from 
waterfall to agile to devops to lean agile to path program whatever right extreme programming so on and so forth there is an evolution in the space of infrastructure from a point where you were buying these huge humongous servers and putting it in your data center to a point where people don't even see servers anymore right you buy it by a click of a button you don't know the size of it all you know is a it's m1 m2 m3 whatever that name means just go provision it on the fly get go get your work done right when all of this is advanced when you think about operations people have been solving the problem the way they have been solving it 20 years back right that's the issue and hark was conceived exactly to fix uh, to fix that particular problem to think about a modern way of operating a modern workload right that's exactly what hark is so it brings together finest engineering talent so the the teams are trained in specific ways of working we we have invested and implemented some of the ip we work with best in, best of the breed partner ecosystem and i'll talk to that in a minute and we've got these facilities in dallas and i am talking from my office in dallas which is a hark facility in the us from where we deliver for our customers um and then back in hyderabad we've got one more that we opened and these are facilities from where we deliver hark services for our customers as well right and then we're expanding it in japan and portugal as we move into 23 that's kind of the plan that we're thinking through um however that's what hark is lisa right that's our solution to this cloud complexity problem right Got it, and it sounds like it's going quite global, which is fantastic. So, Suresh, I want to have you expand a bit on the partnership, the partner ecosystem, and and the role that it plays. You talked about it a little bit, but what role does the partner ecosystem play in really helping JCI to dial down some of those challenges and the inherent complexities that we talked about? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, partners play a major role, and JCI is very, very good at it. Uh, I mean, I've joined JCI. 18 months ago jci leverages partners uh, pretty extensively uh, as i said i leverage uh, hitachi ventura for my uh, you know a group in the sre space in the cloud operations space and they're my primary partner but at the same time we leverage many other partners so really you know accenture hcl and even on the tooling side we use datadog and uh, portworks all these guys are major partners of ours because the way we like to pick partners is based on our vision and where we want to go and pick the right partner who's going to really you know uh, make you successful by investing their resources in you and what i mean by that is when you have a partner partner knows exactly what kind of skill set is needed for this customer for them to really be successful as i said earlier uh we do we cannot really get all the skill set that we need we rely on the partners and partners bring the right skill set they can scale i can tell uh prime tomorrow hey i need two pods uh by next week and i can guarantee it he's going to bring two pods to me so they let you scale they let you move fast and i'm a big believer in today's day and age to get things done uh, uh fast and be more agile i'm not worried about failure but i'm for me moving fast is very very important and partners really do a very good job bringing that but I, and then they also really make you think isn't it because one thing i like about partners they make you innovate whether they know it or not but they do because you know they will come and ask you questions about hey tell me why you are doing this can i review your architecture you know um and then they will try to really say i don't think this is going to work because they work with so many different clients not jci they bring all that expertise and that's what i look from them you know just not you know do a tnm job for me i ask you to do this code they just bring more than that that's how i pick my partners and that's how you know itachi's uh, ventura is definitely one of a good partner from that sense because they bring a lot more innovation to the table and i appreciate about that so. it sounds like it sounds like a flywheel of innovation yeah. um i love yeah. that last question for both of you is we're almost out of time here prem i want to go back to you so I, so i'm a partner and planning on redefining cloud ops at my company what are the two things you want me to re- remember from hitachi ventura's perspective so so uh, uh, before i get to that question lisa the partners that we work with are slightly different from the partners that uh, again there are some similar partners there are some different partners right for example we pick and choose especially in the hawk space we pick and choose partners that are more future focused right we don't care if they are huge companies or small companies 
Um, we, we go after companies that are future focused, that are really, really nimble and can change for our customers' need because it's not our need, right? When I pick partners for Hark, my ultimate endeavor is to ensure in this case, because we've got Suration GCI on, we are able to operate their environment with the level of satisfaction above and beyond that they are expecting from us. And whatever I don't have, I need to get from my partners so that I bring the solution to Suresh as opposed to bringing a whole load of people and making them stand in front of Suresh. That's how I think about partners. Uh, what, do, what do I want them to do? From And we've always done this. So we do workshops with our partners. We just don't go buy tools. When we say we are partnering with XYZ, we do workshops with them and we say, this is how we are thinking. Either you build it in your roadmap that helps us leverage you, continue to leverage you. And we do have minimal investments where we fix gaps by building some utilities for us to deliver the best service to our customers. And our intention is not to build a product to compete with our partner. Our intention is to just fill the white space until they go build it into their product suite that we can then leverage it for our customers. So always think about uh, end customers and how can we make it easy for them because for all the tool vendors out there seeing this and wanting to partner with Itachi, the biggest thing is tool sprawl, especially on the cloud, is very real. For every problem on the cloud, I have a billion tools that are being thrown at me as Suresh, if I'm putting my, uh, my Suresh's mm -hmm. hat. And it's not easy at all. It's so confusing. Yeah. So that's what we want. We want people to simplify that landscape for our end customers. And we are looking at partners that are thinking through the simplification, not just making money. That makes perfect sense. There, there's, there really is a very strong symbiosis. It sounds like in the partner ecosystem, and there's a lot of enablement that goes on back and forth. It sounds like as well, which is really to your point. It's all about the end customers and what they're expecting. So, our last question for you is, which is the same one. If I'm a partner, what are the things that you want me to to consider as I'm planning to redefine cloud ops at my company? I'll keep it simple. I, uh, in my view, just, I mean, we've touched upon in multiple facets in this interview about that. The three things, first and foremost, reliability. You know, in today's day and age, my products has to be reliable, available, and, you know, make sure that the customer is happy with what they're really dealing with, number one. Number two, my product has to be secure. Security is super, super important, okay? And number three, I need to really make sure my customers are getting the value so I have to keep my cost low. So these three is where what I would focus and what I expect from my partners. Great advice, guys. Thank you so much for talking through this with me and really showing the audience how strong the partnership is between Hitachi Ventara and JCI, what you're doing together. We'll have to talk to you again to see where things go, but we really appreciate your insights and your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. For my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. Thank you so much for watching.